Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from the Gospel Coalition, which is a group of churches that have decided to try and do something about the fact that churches can't seem to agree on much of anything. But Jesus wanted them to be united, so they should at least form a council of people who could decide on some of the key important details, while leaving the minor details up to the individual churches. So naturally, prominent council member Mark Driscoll left in 2012 so that he could spend more time focusing on his church network, Mars Hill Church Network. And of course a bunch of you probably know who Driscoll is because of all the controversy surrounding his ministry, but this video isn't about that. It's about the Gospel Coalition. But first, a word from today's sponsor, Surfshark. Okay, time to find some creationist stuff to respond to. What the? Oh, Mrs. Rhino? Why are you dressed like that? Well, I was poking through your browser history on our router, and I noticed that you seem to be into some stuff that you've never told me about. But you can't know about that. I was using incognito mode. Incognito mode might stop your browser history from being safe locally, but there is nothing stopping the owner of a router from tracking every site you visit while connected to their Wi-Fi. What if I were to use Surfshark? What Surfshark? Surfshark is a VPN, or virtual private network. It keeps your data private by encrypting all the information sent between your device and the internet. Meaning that if I had thought to use it, then you, or the owner of the local coffee shop with the free Wi-Fi, wouldn't be able to access my data, keeping it private and secure. In fact, now that I think about it, when we went to that Airbnb last month, we used Surfshark to secure our device's connections because it's never wise to just blindly trust someone else's Wi-Fi. Also with Surfshark, we've been able to unlock location-restricted content so we could watch American Netflix whenever we want. They even include a clean web feature which blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, allowing you to surf the web safely. That, that sounds expensive. Nope. My viewers can pick it up with a steep discount by visiting my special URL in the video description and using promo code RHINO at checkout, which will get them 83% off the regular price and three extra months for free. But what if they don't like it? Oh, they will. And Surfshark is so sure of that that they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. Wow, that sounds great. But right now, it's time to come and play. Are those handcuffs? Surfshark. Don't let your web surfing jump the shark. What? That's what happens when companies let me write my own tagline for the ad. Okay, I'm not in the mood anymore. Uh, hello? Mrs. Rhino? Can you unlock the handcuffs? Toss me back the key at least. Hello? Fine, I wanted to stay here indefinitely anyway. So Russell, Bodie, uh, a lot of Christians seem to lose their footing when they're talking with a neighbor about homosexuality. Pro tip, just don't. You don't have to talk to a neighbor about homosexuality. In this instance, I assume neighbor isn't specifically the person who lives beside them, but rather just another person that you interact with at least semi-regularly. But yeah, if you frequently interact with someone who is gay, the best way to not lose your footing is to not bring it up. How many times would you talk to your straight friends about their heterosexuality? There are zero instances that I can think of at the moment where bringing up their sexual orientation would be an appropriate thing to do, so why would it be any different for someone who is homosexual? Now, if you actually have honest questions that you want to know the answers to, there are places you can get those answers without making these people in your life feel like they're being attacked. But make sure that you don't just stick to approved church resources, because you'll likely be getting a very skewed picture of the LGBTQ community from an organization that is explicitly anti-LGBTQ. Just bear in mind that, even when well-intentioned, some random person on the street is not obligated to be your personal ambassador for all things LGBTQ. LGBTQ, and they probably don't appreciate being asked about their sexual orientation or gender identity any more than your straight cis neighbor would. Um, in trying to explain why it's wrong. Oh, okay, I guess that was a mistake on my part. I was assuming that there was an honest desire to learn behind the questions. Nope, just an attempt to make them change who they are because who they are makes you uncomfortable. I mean, we can, they know how to quote maybe a couple Bible verses, but explaining the wrongness of it, especially when the response is, well, it's not hurting anybody, so how could it be wrong if it's not harming anybody? Not only is it not harming anyone, but you guys being anti-LGBTQ is actually incredibly harmful to LGBTQ people. 
Minority stress is a real thing where people that are members of a sexual minority experience significantly more stress in their lives that is directly related to the stigmatization of their orientation or identity. These extra stressors can contribute to things like mental health issues, and leading a high stress life can have health effects beyond mental health. Increased stress has a corresponding increase for a number of disorders. I mean, starting with the obvious, high stress levels can cause pathophysiologic changes in the brain which manifest as behavioral, cognitive, and mood disorders. Stress can have a negative impact on immune system function, it negatively impacts the cardiovascular system, it can cause gastrointestinal problems, and a whole bunch more. So when you take it upon yourself to talk to your neighbor about why their sexual orientation is morally wrong, you are adding stress to their lives and contributing to potential future health problems. On the flip side, there are well-documented health benefits associated with the legalization of gay marriage. After legalization, there was a significant decrease in the number of visits for both medical and mental health care, and a corresponding reduction in mental health care costs, regardless of whether the individuals themselves were single partners or married. And after a bunch of states banned same-sex marriage in the 2000s, there was a significant increase in psychological distress in those states, which was attributed not just to the ban of marriage for same-sex couples, but to the loud debate about the topic, with anti-LGBTQ groups being extra loud in their attacks, reinforcing stigma, prejudice, and discrimination. In other words, if you read through the Negative Health Consequences of Same-Sex Sexual Behavior page on the Christian Medical and Dental Association website, basically every item on their list can be attributed to the additional stress caused by people like them who are advocating against these civil rights. And those items on this list which are not directly caused by this additional stress are problems that result from inadequate sex education, which can be traced back to these same groups. What would you guys say to that? Well, I would say, first of all, you have to ask, what is this for? What is sexuality for? In a word, sexuality is for fulfillment. Sexual fulfillment is just as important to a healthy life as finding fulfillment in any other area of your life. And it means different things to different people. Finding out exactly what it means to you is a journey that can last for your whole life. And this journey is often discouraged, if not outright forbidden, by religious authorities who seek to control your sex life, insisting that it's just for procreation, with physical pleasure being a byproduct that you're allowed to enjoy in one context, and only one context, a heterosexual marriage. I still have a book from my Christian days called A Celebration of Sex, a guide to enjoying God's gift of sexual intimacy. It's actually rather progressive for a Christian book on sex, though it certainly nods to the belief that contraceptives go against God's plan, it does not condemn them and actually goes through some of the pros and cons for each. It talks about different positions, oral sex, foreplay, and all sorts of stuff that is often considered taboo by the church. But if we read the chapter on homosexuality, the whole thing begins with the assumption that it's a problem of one partner in a heterosexual marriage struggling with homosexual attraction. It never even considers the possibility of just being gay. No, you're straight, but you struggle with homosexual urges sometimes. And it gives instructions on how to manage these attractions in order that you might have a successful heterosexual marriage. And then even with how liberal they can be with most other aspects of sex, they don't even allow for heterosexual couples to have anal sex, basically saying that the butt's designed for things going out, not for things going in, so just stay out of there. My point is, Sexuality is so much more than just procreation, and even a fairly liberal Christian view on sexuality attempts to constrain it to this one single acceptable context, and that just isn't healthy for anyone. And so if we believe that God designed this, then that means that there's a, there's a purpose to it, and the complementarity of a man and a woman in a marriage relationship, fidelity, one flesh, uh, that stands behind the whole reason for the design of sexuality. It's yeah. not just an individual matter. Whether or not God designed sex is completely irrelevant. But you aren't talking about sexuality, despite having used that word. You are just talking about sex, the sexual act. To me, this suggests that you consider all of sexuality to be encompassed by this one action, which is just flat out not true. 
It's uh, something that has to do with binding those two together in connection with future generations and with the generations that have come before. Which is just a weird way to say that sex is for procreation, and any of the benefits of sex outside of that are only there to encourage couples to stay together to raise children. Which is actually kind of consistent for how these extra benefits would have developed through evolution, but just because they developed because of those selection pressures does not mean that those specific things have to be the only valid purpose for sex today. But even if they were, homosexual couples enjoy the same benefits, minus the procreation part. For now. That's coming. So my question here is, if sex is mainly for procreation, what is your opinion on heterosexual couples that can't have children without medical intervention? And if their marriages are legitimate even though they need science to have babies, does that not mean by extension that homosexual marriages should be considered legitimate once we develop the technology to assist them with procreation? And if that would legitimize their union, then what really is your objection? At its core, it's what you said earlier, the Bible says it's icky, therefore you don't like it. Except, really, if you dig down, it's the other way around. You think it's icky, so you find verses in the Bible that agree with you. And since you can make the Bible say literally whatever you want it to say, that's not a hard thing to do. So it's kind of a big picture discussion about why do we even have sex? Well, mm -hmm. what, what's the purpose here? There are many purposes for sex. Procreation is but one. And the other problem is what a lot of our gay and lesbian neighbors assume is that we have marriage and we're wanting to restrict this marriage and we're not wanting them to have it. So we're wanting to keep something to ourselves. You're making it sound like marriage is a commodity with scarcity, where if you give marriage to one group of people, that somehow takes it away from the other one. No, that's not it. LGBTQ people just want equal rights. That's it. You don't have to like gay marriage, you don't have to participate in it, you just have to not force your bigotry onto others through the law. What we're saying is not, we don't want you to be able to get married. We're saying that same-sex marriage is impossible uh, right. based upon what uh, sexuality and what marriage is. Okay, fine. You're allowed to believe that a gay couple that got married is not really married in the eyes of God or whatever. That's a stupid position to hold, but nobody's fighting to take that right away from you. But your belief that same-sex marriage is impossible does not mean you get to impose your antiquated definitions and beliefs onto everyone who disagrees with you. So how about you take a more live-and-let-live live approach, since it literally cannot possibly affect you either way? Like, really, if it's impossible for them to be married, then why oppose them being allowed to get married? According to you, it's not even possible anyway, so it seems like a waste of effort fighting against something that's not possible. So it's not that we're trying to disappoint our neighbors. We're saying this is, this is for the good of human flourishing, yeah. uh, and we love you. Uh, that's the reason why not only do we say uh, that we think there's, there's some restrictions for you, there's some restrictions on us. How could restricting gay marriage have an impact on human flourishing if it's not even possible in the first place? But really, what you have said here is objectively and demonstrably false. LGBTQ people do better when they aren't living under legal restrictions that don't even apply to other people, like outlawing same-sex marriage. It is a fact that the mental health of the LGBTQ community gets better when same-sex marriage is allowed, and worse when it's outlawed. So don't pretend you're after human thriving here. If that really was your goal, then you would be right there fighting for equal rights for the LGBTQ community, because when they are accepted for who they are and are treated equally, that is objectively better for their physical and mental health. Right. Uh, in terms of what uh, what this looks like. Yeah, and they always have been. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's an important point. And I think people also need to understand two things. One, we say it's not harming anybody. It's me in my bedroom. Well, the current debate about marriage explodes that myth. So the fact that you guys vocally oppose same-sex marriage explodes the myth that it's a private matter? Dude, if you just let everyone marry whomever they want and stop pronouncing judgment on them for their choice in life partner, then it would absolutely just be a private matter. But in order to gain equality, they had to make a lot of noise about the fact that they didn't currently have equality. They still don't in a lot of ways. I mean, they're allowed to get married now, but there's a lot of other issues that need to be dealt with. Your opposition to equality is what brings all this out into the public. So if you don't want to hear about it, stop talking about it. But ultimately, 
that's not even what that means. When people say that marriage is a private matter, they aren't talking about a discussion about who is allowed to marry who, they are talking about actual marriages. When two people decide to get married, that is a private matter between those two people. Nobody is forcing their marriage onto you, it has nothing to do with you. It's between them. If this is a civil rights issue, and if us not doing weddings for homosexuals or not hiring homosexuals becomes violating civil rights, then it is not conceivable that the church will be unharmed by this. Mm -hmm. There were churches arguing pretty much the same thing back in the 50s and 60s, except it was about black people then. If not being allowed to deny people equal rights for completely arbitrary reasons violates a fundamental tenet of your religion, then maybe you need to take a step back and ask yourself why your religion would be opposed to civil rights in the first place. So th that, that myth is exploded. This is not private. This is public. So would you say the same about, say, interracial marriages? Should churches be allowed to refuse to marry couples who are interracial? If you say no, then I would ask how same-sex marriages are any different. The Bible explicitly condemns miscegenation. It's actually in one of the Ten Commandments, at least the Exodus 34 set of Ten Commandments. There's also the story of Phinehas, who was rewarded by God for murdering a Midianite woman for marrying a Hebrew man, who he also murdered. And yet, I don't hear apologetics organizations fighting tooth and nail against the fact that interracial marriages are legal. So it seems that the church has made a compromise in order that their morality can keep up with modern morality. I mean, it's lagging behind by a few decades to a few centuries depending on the issue, but it does move forward, slowly. The other thing is that all legal decisions are based on principles and established precedent. And right now the principle is, you know, sort of the, the Beatles mentality. All you need is love. Well, if that's the case, you, you, if marriage is based on popular opinion and who loves each other, the 50-year-old man and the 12-year-old boy. That is a completely unjustified jump in logic. There are all sorts of legal restrictions on what a child is or is not allowed to do, restrictions that would amount to civil rights violations if they were applied to any other group of people. The fact that we allow people of all genders, races, sexual orientations, and religions to buy alcohol does not inevitably lead to the legal sale of alcohol to 12-year-olds. If a law were to be passed that would restrict the sale of alcohol to people based on race, that law would be struck down as unconstitutional. And yet, we allow the restriction based on age. So why would allowing marriage for all these same groups inevitably lead to allowing marriage for children? Also, generally speaking, it's the people who are fighting for LGBTQ rights who are also trying to make child marriage illegal in the US, but they are finding opposition at every turn coming from religious lawmakers. So don't tell me that allowing gay marriage will lead to child marriage when child marriage is already a reality that is being kept alive by the same people who are opposed to gay marriage. Oh yeah, and fun fact, remember those restrictions that we place on children? One of them is their ability to enter into contracts. Marriage seems to be the exception here, where they are permitted to enter into a marriage contract in all but four states, with some states allowing for the marriage of girls as young as 12, and some having no minimum age at all. But because marriage is the exception rather than the rule, these children are unable to enter into a contract with say, a lawyer, in order to get a divorce, effectively trapping them in this dangerous situation. So, Vody, if you really are against child marriage, don't waste your energy fighting the LGBTQ community, speak out against the religious groups that practice it, and fight for it to be outlawed with no exceptions. Because that situation you described is literally permitted in a bunch of states right now. Um, so on and so forth. And everybody say, oh, red herring. No. No, it's not a red herring, it's a slippery slope fallacy, made all the more fallacious by your side's general reluctance to do anything about already legal child marriages that are happening right now. Not once the principle is established. So this is not private, right, right. and it doesn't stop here. There is no principle in allowing same-sex marriage that would necessarily lead to child marriage. I don't know of a single person in the LGBTQ community who is actually advocating for child marriage. In fact, it's from the people who have a very loose view on sex that I most often hear reiterations that all participants must be enthusiastically consenting adults. Want to have an orgy? Great! Have fun! Just make sure that everyone who's there actually wants to be there and that they are all adults. 
Want a polyamorous relationship? Great! Just make sure that everyone is on board, and adults. Want a monogamous relationship? Great! As long as everyone in it is an enthusiastically consenting adult. This is not what you hear from the other side. There's a lot of fear-mongering, much like Vodi is doing here, but there isn't usually a discussion of consent. And there's actually a disturbing number of times when consent is discussed, it's actually about how God's consent is more important than the woman's consent, rather than actually, you know, dealing with giving consent for sex. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we ought to even challenge the principle that just because something doesn't harm, that that takes it out of the realm of morality. Yeah. And how does one measure morality if not by the consequences of the actions that are taken? Now, I know there are different schools of thought on how we determine morality, but functionally, practically, how do we really measure morality? It's by consequences. But actually, I agree. Same-sex marriage is not outside of the realm of morality. It is not amoral. But it's also not immoral. It is morally good, because if we look at the consequences of allowing same-sex marriage, they are almost exclusively positive, with the only negative consequences being the hurt feelings of bigots such as these guys. If you cheat on your wife and she never finds out about it and you lie about it, is, is it wrong? And I think most people would say yes, because yeah. lying is inherently wrong. Lying is not necessarily inherently wrong. Sometimes a lie can accomplish good, and so it will be a morally good lie. The problem with cheating on your wife and never getting caught is in the fact that you are breaking a promise that you made, and doing so in a way that will be hurtful to the person if they should find out. Whether or not they actually do find out is irrelevant. Now, if a couple have an open or polyamorous relationship, that's a different matter. I think by your definitions they would still be cheating, but if everyone in the relationship knows what is and is not allowed, then no promises are being broken, and I don't really see a problem with that. And then the other thing is, is realizing that a lot of times harm does not reveal itself immediately. That's true. So it's a good thing we have decades of data showing that there is no harm in allowing same-sex marriage. Right. You know, if you if you if you if you are violent towards someone, that's an immediate effect. But right. you have to look at the long term effect of the harm. And for as long as there's been human history, you, you mentioned this, Vody, that um, the sanctuary um, into which families have been brought forward has been a monogamous relationship between two opposite genders where they learn to love the other. Oh, tell me you've never read the Bible without actually saying you've never read the Bible. How many wives did Jacob have again? Was it four? No, it was two. The other two were his wife's slaves that he used as concubines. How about Abraham? Well, he only had one wife, Sarah, but when Sarah couldn't have kids, he used her slave Hagar as a surrogate uterus. And when Hagar ran away because of the abuse she suffered at Sarah's hand, God sent an angel to tell her to go back and submit to the abuse. So don't tell me that throughout human history monogamy was the norm. That's not only not true, but your own book says it's not true. And that is what the creator called marriage. Right. Um, you know, the Achilles heel right now, of uh, I think, of, of the homosexual you know, so-called marriage debate is just the utter lack of monogamy. Why would that matter? They have more extramarital sex than heterosexual people, therefore they shouldn't even be allowed to get married in the first place? How is that even remotely relevant? You know, that's something that's not really in that. And so once you start tearing down the otherness of marriage, the sanctuary of monogamy, that lifelong faithfulness into which a family arises, um, the, uh, the harmful effect may not be demonstrably immediate, yeah. but I think you'll see it. And I think a lot of surveys start to bear that out. So long-term homosexual couples tend to be less monogamous than heterosexual couples. You see this as a bad thing, therefore we should ban all homosexual marriage? I hate to break it to you, but whether they are allowed to get married or not, they will pair off and form couples, and sometimes they will even cheat on each other without being married first. I know this is completely unheard of for good upstanding anti-LGBTQ religious folks such as yourself, but out in the real world, it's going to happen whether you allow them to get married or not. And since there are demonstrable health benefits to allowing them to marry, then to deny them that right because they cheat slightly more frequently is just you being a dick. But rather than looking at cheating as you define it, we should maybe look at relationship stability, because homosexual relationships do appear to have a shorter average duration than heterosexual relationships. Of course, minority stress plays a pretty big part in this, as with so many other issues, and this shows with the fact that, yes, homosexual relationships are typically shorter. But as homosexuality becomes more socially acceptable, that gap is getting smaller. 
But also, I think that long term, when homosexuality becomes basically universally acceptable, their relationships have the potential to surpass heterosexual relationships in terms of stability, because they typically have a much healthier conflict resolution style than heterosexual couples do. That is, they fight better, in a way that is more likely to result in actual conflict resolution rather than burying issues to fester and get worse over time. So monogamy be damned, the gays are better at relationshiping than the straights are. Well, one of the things I think that we need to recognize is that the language that's being used here is language that we have already surrendered to. Yes. Uh, one of the reasons why this is such a confusing thing for a lot of evangelical teenagers is because we have been talking as though marriage is an individual yes. uh, matter <laughs> between two people. Uh, our wedding ceremonies, couples are writing their own vows. Right. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're dictating the terms, and this is our big day where Preach we're it, celebrating brother. our life. <laughs> so, wait. Are you against heterosexual marriages that don't have what you consider to be the correct vows? Wow. And given what I've seen so far, I'd be willing to bet that this guy considers the marriage vows that are common and trace their origin to a prayer book from the 1500s to be the correct ones. And he probably advocates for their original version, where the woman vows to obey her husband, while the husband vows to cherish his wife. Because the man always has to be in charge. Because penises make you better at making decisions, I guess. <laughs> and uh, that's not what that's not what marriage is in a Christian yeah. context. Yeah. And so even when for a long time you've had in Christian churches couples who are newly married and the people are coming by and saying now make sure that you wait a long time before you have children so that you're able to enjoy one another. Right. Uh, as though you can't enjoy one another right. raising up children together. Life with kids and life without kids are two very very different things. When you decide to have children should be your choice, not your pastor's, not your church's, yours. The pastor that's telling you that God wants you to have lots of kids right away is not impacted at all by whether or not you actually have kids. He has no skin in the game, so to speak. You do. Well, I suppose you could say that your pastor does as well. If you have kids when you're not ready, you'll be more dependent on using your church as a support network, and a kid raised in the church is more likely to grow up to give tithes to that church. So in that sense, he does have skin in the game, but he's not concerned about your best interest in that scenario. Well, you're, you're already right. surrendering to the terms mm -hmm. that the rest of the culture says, well, if that's what marriage is, is celebrating a relationship between two people. We have a relationship, why shouldn't we do this? And if you have a problem with that, that doesn't make those relationships invalid, that just makes you a dick. So I think we've gotta back up and reclaim in our own churches a, a longer, bigger definition of what marriage is and mm -hmm. start grounding that back in Ephesians 5 rather than the ways that we've commented. I guess you're welcome to do that for your church, but for legal purposes, that's a completely pointless gesture. So maybe related to this, what does, what role does the church have right now in speaking about this issue? I mean, there's some who say this discussion's lost. We just need to let the world be the world and we'll just focus on the church. I mean. Or you could just stop being the comical villains of the story and get with the times. If history is anything to go by, that will happen eventually, but with much kicking and screaming along the way. You guys are the kickers and screamers that history will present as examples of people who were scared of necessary social changes. The fact of the matter is, we're in this world, although we're not of this world. The fact of the matter is, the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Mm -hmm. No, that is most definitely not the fact of the matter. In this world, but not of it, is some pretty arrogant shit right there. We are the arbiters of morality. We decide who gets to get married and who doesn't. We must control everyone else. Uh, whoops, don't listen to that last one. Of course it's not about control, we just want what's best. And money. Lots of money. No, Vody, the church is not the singular pillar of morality that keeps everybody from the dangers of immorality. If anything, it's the exact opposite. How many sex scandals wreak havoc through religious communities? And a lot of the time, these sex scandals are things that don't have to be deal breakers. But because the church is so dead set against anything outside of heterosexual monogamous relationships, anything sex related is a deal breaker. We don't laugh at Jerry Falwell Jr. because he likes to watch his wife have sex with the pool boy. We laugh at him because he does that while insisting that others adhere to your antiquated ideas about sex. Do as I say, not as I do and we don't take the truth and hide it under a bushel. Hmm. That's not the church. We don't live these 
completely separate sort of bifurcated lives, um, that we are the light of the world. We are the salt that preserves. Yeah, well, the light of the world literally caused the Dark Ages. I mean, not by itself. There were other factors, and the Dark Ages were really only a thing in church-controlled Europe, and they weren't quite as they are often depicted, but the setup for that joke was too perfect not to use. But my point is that the church was a hindrance to progress, and this role doesn't seem to have changed much over time. And I dare say that if the church leaders from the Dark Ages were to see the state of the church today, they would be furious with all the compromises that the church has made over the years. How dare we abandon geocentrism? How dare we have translated the Bible into the common languages for people to read for themselves? I mean, Russell Moore, the guy on the right, wrote an opinion piece in the Washington Post back in 2015 calling for compassion during the Syrian refugee crisis, saying that we shouldn't be turning refugees away just because we're afraid that some of them might be terrorists. Do you think that the church leaders who presided over the Crusades would have agreed with a position that would allow thousands of Muslims into their home territories? They would be appalled. So somehow, the morality of the church keeps adapting to fit with overall morality of the society in which it finds itself, but it's always just not quite there. It's almost like it's a part of the Christian persecution complex. It's easier to feel persecuted if you view social progress as persecution, so you can't ever be in favor of social progress, but given the progress that has happened in spite of the church's best efforts, you'd just be laughed at if you were advocating for the kinds of things that the 15th century church would want to advocate for, so you have to make a certain amount of progress while still staying behind the times. I had a pastor tell me not long ago, he said, why don't we just say, let's Read, allow everybody to redefine marriage on the outside, and we'll just maintain Christian marriage on the inside of the church. That would be a semi-reasonable compromise, but as long as you're offering marriages as a public service, you need to follow the laws relating to that public service. You could always just do the Kent Hovind thing and completely ignore marriage laws and just consider marriage within your church to be the real deal. I think legally speaking, he's still married to wife number two, but he's on wife number four, so you could do that. And I said, well, we tried that with the divorce culture. Yeah. Uh, and, and what happens? We wind up with churches that have said, we're, going to, we're just going to allow this to take place, no right. fault divorce on the outside, not speak to it, and then speak to it internally. And that collapses into the church. It transforms yeah. the nature of the church, right. number one. Yeah, well, again, divorce is one of those things that should be freely available to all who are married. Sometimes people change. Sometimes people hide their true self until after the wedding. Sometimes you didn't know that your partner was going to resort to abuse. Sometimes infidelity happens. And sometimes a relationship that worked in the short term just isn't viable in the long term. I mean, really, it's tempting to throw the fact that evangelicals have a higher than average divorce rate at people like this, but that treats divorce with a stigma that it shouldn't have. There really shouldn't be any stigma associated with getting out of a relationship that is no longer mutually beneficial to the people in the relationship. The only reason that it's notable is, again, because of the hypocrisy. They preach about not divorcing, but then they divorce more than other demographics. Number two is not loving to neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, we have That's an accountability to one another. Divorce hurts kids, hurts families, hurts the entire social fabric. What hurts kids more than divorce is to be raised in a hostile environment. It is better for a child to be raised by a single mother than it is for them to be raised by a mother and a father where the father is abusive. But you don't even have to go so far as abuse. Statistically, yes, all else being equal, it is better for kids to be raised by two parents than by one. But I have a sneaking suspicion that this effect is more due to the division of labor than there being anything inherently bad about only having one parent. That is, a house is less stressful when multiple parents are present to share in the responsibility of raising a child. Two parents can share the workload, reducing stress, and with two working parents, that increases security, decreasing stress even more. Remember that whole thing earlier about the negative health outcomes associated with stress? Yeah, that applies here too. So does the expanding out of marriage to where marriage doesn't mean anything anymore. Right. Who said it doesn't mean anything anymore? I don't know of anyone arguing for that. The closest I can find is people arguing that civil unions should just be the default and should be allowed to be structured however the people in those unions want, and marriage can be an extra religious thing that you can opt into if you want. 
I think that's a pretty good compromise, and it allows you to continue using your religion as a bigotry shield when you deny same-sex couples their wedding. Because your part isn't the legal part, it's just the religious part, and it's not the government's business to adjudicate religious rituals. But as long as the religious ritual is tied to the legal part, and you provide the legal part as a public service, then you should have to provide that service to anyone that is legally able to marry. I mean, there's, there's, there's a reason why the state is involved in marriage in the first place. Yeah, and it's mostly administrative stuff. Figuring out how to distribute estates after a death, finding out who's allowed to visit an unconscious patient in the hospital, taxes, insurance, stuff like that. Stuff that has nothing to do with religion and need not be denied to anyone because of their sexual orientation. State doesn't have anything to do with registering people as friends. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with those things. <laughs> it has an interest in male-female marriage yeah. because male-female marriage can lead to something very dangerous for the state. I'm sorry, are you trying to imply that the government only wants to promote same-sex marriage to decrease the number of children because children are somehow a threat to the state? How the fuck does that make any sense? The state actually has a vested interest in people having more kids, for much the same reason as the church. More kids equals more money in their pocket, more people to tax or to extract tithes from. But really, if you make it illegal for the gay couple to be married, they're not going to suddenly up and change orientation in order to get married and thereby pop out some kids, because that's not how sexuality works. And that is children. And, and the state has to say, <laughs> Who is the father of this child? Right. Who's accountable for yes, paying exactly. for this child? Or how about instead of asking who is the father of this child, the state could ask who is the legal guardian of this child? Because even before same-sex marriage was legalized, it wasn't always the father who was responsible for the child. Some kids live with their grandparents, some with their mother, some with their aunt or uncle, some in foster care, etc, etc. The only situations in which the biological parents of the child are relevant are medical situations. Exactly. That's the distinction there. And you think also the spiritual danger. I mean, just thinking of the, of the role of the church as, the, as priest in the community. First yeah. Corinthians 6, those who practice such things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But why do you focus so much on the homosexuality that is in that list of things that prevent people from inheriting the kingdom of God, but not on the other things like idolatry, adultery, thieving, greed, and being a drunkard? Why do you not rail against people like Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen, who are clearly consumed by their greed with their private jets and their mansions, just as vehemently as you rail against homosexuality? Greed is actually far more prevalent in humans than homosexuality is, and there are no laws against it. It is perfectly legal to be as greedy as you want. But there are no anti-greed leagues being formed by churches, no videos railing about how greed will get you sent to hell. I mean, sure, sermons are preached occasionally that talk about being generous and avoiding greed, but it doesn't get anywhere near the attention that homosexuality does, despite it being much more prevalent than homosexuality and being included in the same list of faults that will deny you entrance into heaven. The fact that you choose to focus on this one thing to the exclusion of the others is quite telling. This is in many ways a gospel issue yeah, because absolutely. we fail to preach here. Absolutely. You know, I think of John the Baptist. I've thought about, mm -hmm. you know, him in this culture. You know, I mean, just think about the absurdity of his death and you can hear the critics I mean, today say, well, see, that's what you get from messing around in politics. Right, of course, right, right. Herod's gonna sleep with his brother's wife because they're the world. We got the world be the yeah, world. Yeah. I don't understand this. Are you saying that LGBTQ rights advocates would say that John the Baptist got what he deserved from meddling in politics? Because I've literally never heard anyone say that ever on any side of any argument. Why aren't you surprised? Right, right. Yeah. That just kills me when people, why aren't you surprised? Like, yeah, Jesus yeah. called him the greatest <laughs> yeah. prophet that had ever lived, yeah. you know, up until his time. And you think of where is the spirit of John the Baptist who, I mean, are we willing to, the spirit, the spirit of John the Baptist's enemy, uh, the spirit of John the Baptist's enemies is at work within them today, but where is yeah. the John the Baptist mm -hmm. in our culture? Yeah. So persecution narrative then? We have to speak out against social progress in order to continue to be persecuted? And, of course, you have to cast your bigotry in the light of doing what's right against all opposition. Like, no, you guys are causing real harm with shit like this. If you want to do what's right, then come to terms with the fact that the Bible got this one wrong. The Bible got a lot of other stuff wrong, and often it's stuff that you guys don't seem to have a problem with, despite the Bible being very clear about it. But no, gotta die on this hill, because it's the one that'll turn your persecution narrative into a semi-reality. Also, this isn't really relevant to anything, but it's really bothering me that he pronounces it John the Baptist. It's Baptist with a P, P, not a B. 
because they say on the one hand, well, now you guys are concerned, but nobody says anything about divorce. That's a flat out lie. <laughs> No, it's not that you don't say anything about divorce, it's that you are much less vocal about divorce than about homosexuality. And again, divorce happens way more often than homosexuality happens. But for some reason, homosexuality bears the brunt of your attack. Greed and divorce are both presented in the Bible as being at least as bad as homosexuality, and both of those things are much more prevalent in society than homosexuality is, but you don't focus nearly as much of your attention on divorce as you do on homosexuality. And the stigma stigma of having divorced and remarried in the church is significantly less than the stigma of being open about the fact that you are LGBTQ. Christians, and both of you have hit on this, Christians either saying, well, why are you surprised? That's them. This is us. Or saying, well, the state has no business and no place in marriage. And I think you just succinctly addressed Nobody that. Nobody believes that. He did not succinctly address that. And a lot of people really do believe that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, unless yeah. you have children yeah. who are abandoned on the side of the road yeah. uh, and the state has no interest, if that's, if that's the kind of world you want to live in, right. uh, then that's the case. How in the ever-loving fuck did we get from the state has no interest in marriage to if the state really had no interest in marriage, there'd be a bunch of kids abandoned on the side of the road? How does that even remotely follow? I would love to see how you connect those dots in your head. Actually, no, come to think of it, I don't think I'd like those connection points very much. But that's, that's not the world anyone wants to live in. I mean, not even the Roman Empire was that bad off. And why do you think we would be that bad off if we allowed gay marriage? Or rather, if we got the state out of the marriage business and just went to a system of civil union? Right. Uh, and so we have to have the state coming in, right. even, even just at the level of adjudicating between people, what right. Solomon had to do. And why does it matter for the purposes of adjudication whether the people being adjudicated between are homosexual, heterosexual, or anything else? Right. Uh, or who, right. Who, who, does he, who do these babies belong a to? A woman who's abandoned. Yeah, exactly. Well, what do we do? Somebody's responsible when yeah. a woman's abandoned. And that becomes a judicial issue there. When a woman is abandoned? How about being the adult woman that she is, she is responsible for herself? Vody is actually pretty reprehensible when it comes to his views on women. He was very much against Sarah Palin being vice president because women belong in the home, not in leadership roles. And quite frankly, feminism has gained a foothold in many evangelical churches. Do you think and that's a good thing? No, I don't. Not at all. Why not? Uh, well, because we're about the gospel. So this little statement about grown women needing someone to be responsible for them kind of betrays this misogynistic streak. I think what people are trying to say is the state doesn't have the authority to define marriage. I mean, as long as there are laws about marriage, then yes, it does. But as I have suggested here, I think it would be better if there were a distinction between a religious marriage and a legal civil union, in which case the state would leave the definition of marriage up to the religions that practice it, and all the legal stuff that comes up currently as a result of marriage would be shifted to being tied to civil unions. The main problem with that is that inevitably there would be religious leaders who would take advantage of that to marry someone and then screw them over from a legal perspective by preaching that God would be against the civil union aspect of it, and so the people that this preacher marries don't get the legal protection that comes with the civil union. I'm not entirely sure how to solve that problem, but I am pretty sure that Vody would be exactly the kind of preacher who would take advantage of that scenario. And I, that's exactly right. And I'll go there, yeah. but they have to acknowledge what the definition is. is. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Um, this is a discussion that needs to happen. It's probably going to um, need to happen a lot more on local church levels as people have got to get aware of why this is wrong and what it is. So I appreciate the wisdom you gentlemen share. They did not share anything approaching wisdom. They shared homophobia, fear-mongering, and provided a glimpse into their painfully regressive view of women's rights. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Deb Idiosepius, who says, And now I really, really want some of that well-intentioned chocolate. Well, I'll give you guys this exclusive special offer. If you send me $200 on PayPal and include your mailing address and a note that says that this is what this is for, I will buy a chocolate bar, think nice things at it, and then mail it to you. I do not promise results, nor that the chocolate bar will even be a good chocolate bar, and I highly recommend against wasting your money in this way, but I think now that I've said that I'm legally obligated to actually follow through or be liable for false advertising stuff. But that said, please don't send me money for thinky chocolate. 
Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Jeffrey Dahmer, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the abandoned women who need to be adjudicated by my channel. If you'd like to have all your agency stripped away, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, links to social media, all the ways to support the channel, and to my other projects like my podcast with my daughter can be found at links.vicerhino.com. Com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! Today's comment of the day comes to us from Dead. Dead. <laughs> the Dead Idiosepius. Dead Squid. Oh. Idiosepius is a type of squid. So that's why that's funny. <laughs>